this is a very special edition of Calm and Connected, our online port, uh, platform to connect ourselves in remote learning and learn strategies that build courage and resilience. And there can be no better guest on planet Earth than our guest today. His name is Dr. Roberto Canessa. He is one of the survivors of the miracle in the Andes, the 1972 plane crash where the survivors found their way out of the mountains and they, he has come here to, to teach us lessons about how to build courage and strength. So welcome to the show and to our school community, Dr. Canessa. How are you? It's a pleasure here. I'm from Uruguay, South America, at the bottom of South America, on the Atlantic Ocean, between two huge countries like Argentina and Brazil. And we are so thankful that you join us here today. Um, and we are also joined by four of our students who will now each introduce themselves to you and to everyone else. And we will begin with Chloe. Hi, my name is Chloe. Um, I'm, in I'm in 12th grade and I'm really excited to be here. Hi, I'm Tramel. I'm in 12th grade and this is a very amazing experience to meet you. Hi, my name is Chayel and I'm in 11th grade and it's an honor to interact with you today. Hi, um, I'm Naomi Diaz and I'm a sophomore in seventh grade and I'm excited to talk with you. So what, it, what we'd like to do right now is on a weekly basis, what we do is we practice a little bit of meditation and I'd just like to do a very quick five minute meditation with you and then we would like to an interview you. The kids have some very, very powerful questions about how we can build courage and strength in the middle of this COVID crisis. So just to see if we can uh, take a moment maybe to settle in uh, to this moment. And what I'd like to do is something called a mountain meditation. A mountain meditation is a way that we can actually close our eyes, bring our attention to the present moment, and develop qualities of strength and courage right in this present moment. So if you feel comfortable with it, you might want to just allow your eyes to close, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can allow them to just defocus maybe in front of you on the ground. So as you settle in this present moment, Seeing if you can just take a couple in-breaths and out-breaths and feeling the air come in and out of your body. And then you might imagine a mountain that you have seen or one that you can imagine. Seeing the vastness of it, the color of it, the sky above it and around it. And as I continue to give you this guidance, seeing if you can take the strength of the mountain, the characteristics of the mountain, and bring them into your own body. Your legs and your feet are the base of the mountain. Your arms and shoulders are the sloping sides of the mountain. And your head and neck are the peak of the mountain. And just taking a moment to just breathe in and out with this image of the mountain. And as we're hearing now on the call, sometimes there are sounds that surround a mountain. Sometimes there's wind. Sometimes there is rain or snow, seeing if with all of the events, even the sounds that are happening now, if we can settle our attention and take on the qualities of the mountain, strength, fortitude, and courage. As the mountain gets hit with changing circumstances, the mountain stays unmoving, settled strong, 
In the same way, as we breathe in and out, thoughts may come to our mind, sensations may come to our body, even fear and anger can arise. But just like the mountain, we can be settled and still and strong in the face of anything that can happen to us. So just taking a few more in-breaths and out-breaths. And then when you feel up to it, seeing if you can allow your eyes to just gently open. Maybe take a look at your surroundings. Take a deep in-breath and out-breath. And then just come back to this moment with the strength, the resilience of the mountain. So, Dr. Knessa, um, we wanted to share this mountain meditation with you because we know that you spent some time on a, on a, on a mountain in the Andes in 1972 and it gained worldwide attention. Would you share um, this story with us about what happened to you when you were a very young man? I mean, the mountain had been there for millions of years. We were coming from a different society, and suddenly the plane crashed. And that's a very, very abrupt change in environment. You must deal with cold desperation, people dead. In a second, everything changes and you must adapt to the new environment. I think that's a, that's a sensation I, I felt at that moment there. So terrible that I thought it was living a nightmare. I thought that I wasn't really leaving what was going on in there. And you must take decisions and you must get ready to, the cold is very, very, very tough. So you must uh, try and get all together into the fuselage. There are lots of people injured, people dying, people in agony. And then you realize that you're not going to be able to save them all. And as night comes, we get all into the fuselage to the wrecks of the plane. And that night was like the... (laughs) Dante's hell. Yeah, that was the what I remember about that. And the story didn't end there. I mean, you were there for 72 days. Can you walk us through exactly what the experience was? I know there were some big moments that happened along the way. I believe that people normally would expect that uh, they would come and rescue you. Uh, the first reaction of human beings is to be to be rescued. That's a an infantile attitude because your mother, when you were a child, they would take care of you. But then slowly, in the next day, we began to realize that they couldn't see us because a plane came over the fuselage and and never came back. And we had a little radio, and we heard on the radio that. Maybe the search was going to be called off because the weather was terrible and there had been 33 plane crashes in the Andes and no one had survived. So when we had on the radio, we were like given death by the, by the civilized world. So, and then we begin, the food was gone, the little food we had, and there were no trees, no leaves, nothing. We began chewing the shoes that were made of leather. And then someone thought about eating dead bodies. And I was a second year medical school student. And I thought that the fuel was a topic. It had pro- uh, protein and had fat. But I was taking advantage of someone that, although he was dead, he couldn't give me, give me permission. So then I thought if I would be the dead person, I would be 
would be a proud for me, a pride that they will use my body to survive. So with this idea, we begin cutting pieces <clears throat> and one feel terrible and repugnant became everyday um, activity. And some of the boys begin walking around trying to climb the mountains and they were trapped by snowstorms and they had to come back frozen. All the teeth were loose. They could barely see. The mountain is very, very tough. It was more than 10,000 feet, freezing temperatures. And all we had was a fuselage and and you begin to get very, very close to God. I think in these moments is when human beings realize the need of God. The more money you have and the more material thing you have, the easier is not to need God. But as soon as you touch the bottom of human possibilities, a religious feeling comes out. That's for sure. That's human behavior. And what you just shared with us, the story didn't even then end there. I mean, there were big moments. Can you uh, share with those who might not be familiar with the story or the specifics? There was an avalanche at one point. Can you, can you walk us through that? You're absolutely correct. Uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon, the shadows cover the valley. The temperature drops, so we got into the fuselage and we use all the suitcases to the back part of the plane so that we wouldn't freeze. And at that time we begin some talking, praying. If you had a good idea, you would tell it. If you have a sad idea, you will keep it for you. And of course, making plans for when we're back. And the best plan of all, of course, was to build a, a restaurant, to have a restaurant and the kind of food we had there. And one night I was, telling my mother that if she believed in telepathy, telepathy, I was telling her, I'm alive, I'm alive, you have to help me. And at that moment, a avalanche came from the ladder of, of a mountain and it buried us alive. And I tried very strongly to get out, but it was impossible. And the earth gets very thin. And I thought, well, if someone gets out of here, we will say, Roberto died in the plane crash. And I had a feeling that it wasn't very tough. I thought if this is dying, it's not that horrible to die. And then someone took all the snow from my face <coughs> and I could breathe again. And uh, eight more people were killed and we were there in, in the worst situation a human being may imagine. And the day before we had the search had been called off. So we, I, I had envy of the people that were dead. I thought you have made a very good deal because you're not suffering anymore. My, the only difference is that my agony will take longer and that's because I have been a better person and I must pay for my sins. Mm. But then I thought, but I'm alive and I'm very stubborn. And I said, why not? I want to see how this ends. And then the next morning, we know there was daytime because through the window of airplane, we couldn't see light inside. And then a friend said, you know what day is? And I said, I mean, horrible day. He said, no, no, no. Today is my sister's birthday. She's 14. Next year, when she will be 15, we are make, going to make a huge barbecue I'm going to invite you, all of you, and we are going to share that party. And I said, come on, Kalitos Spice, don't be such a fool. We are dying here, and you are telling us about a barbecue with your sister next year. And he said, Roberto, you don't understand. The one that is a fool is you. I'm going to make the barbecue, and I'm not going to invite you. Did you, make the, like, Did you so make the barbecue? He invited me. Did you make the barbecue? Yes, we did. We made 10 barbecues. <laughs> when we were out of there, we were the most 
happy persons in our lives. Uh, last week, the sister, Calito sister, called me and she wanted to buy a, a respirator that we are building ventilators here, and life goes by. And we want to know about what you're building respirators but now I, I, for the COVID. But how did you how did you escape from being there? Seventy two days. How did you get free? Well, one day, one of my friends that was lying with their broken legs, he tells me, Roberto, how good you may feel that you can help other people. How good you can feel that you can help other people. What do you mean? What I mean is that my legs are broken and I'm like a parasite. And I rely on people like you then can walk out of here. Are you sure what you're telling me? Yeah, come on. He said, the sun sets to the west. To the west is Chile. Look at the scale of the map. How much the further the distance would be 70 kilometers. That's 10,000 steps. If you're able to walk 10,000 steps, we are going to be out of here. And then I thought, between dying in the fuselage and going and walking to die walking I thought there was be lots more honor to die walking and giving an image and my commitment from that on in life has been walk to where you get, want to get to and then you will realize that many times the difficulties are not where you think they, they are. There are other places, but still every step you get closer to what you want to achieve. And we were, walk out of the mountains after 10 days. We found a shepherd and we, I mean, everything is there in in the story, in the book, I had to survive. It's everything, every detail is there, and uh, and we're able with a helicopter to rescue all our friends that were still trapped in the fuselage. We had to hike 15,000 feet, freezing temperature. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Hello. Okay. Yes, we hear you. So, so this is in a. Yes, this is in a, in. In a um, an idea of what what were the main things of the plane crash. So, this courage and this honor that you speak about, we really want to see if we can tap into some of that because, as you know, we're in a worldwide COVID pandemic, and some of our students are really uh, struggling right now. So, we wanted to ask our students how they were trying to get strength. So Chloe is going to share a survey that she developed. Chloe, what did you learn about what our students are feeling right now? So the first question we asked was, what have you learned about your own strength and courage during the COVID crisis? And 23% of our students realized that they have strength that they never knew that they had before, that during this pandemic, um, they rose to the occasion. You know, they brought strength out of this struggle. 14% um, realized that they're not as strong as they thought they were. You know, they thought that they would be able to handle this better, but no one has ever been through anything like this. So no one really knows what to do. The second question was, how has your opinion of humanity changed in the pandemic? 39% of people believe that the people around them are kinder than they thought. That during this pandemic, others are being nicer and helping out and, you know, just being more open toward each other. 15% believe that people are less kind that, than they thought. So Tremel also has some specific strategies that some of the students are using to try to inspire courage in themselves. Tremel, can you share that? Yes, I mean, um, we yeah, asked, but, oh, 
Uh, Tremel, hold on a second. Dr. Knessa, go ahead. Well, you, you must go slower because if not, I forget the question. Well, I think courage is like love. It's not about building courage and then uh, doing things. When you are getting in love, you don't, you, you don't say how much love I have to give for, for the couple or for the family or whatever. You, uh, courage is developed on action and you must do things and then you will grow the courage. I think that's, that's, that's great. And, and also the, how people are, uh, they are virtuous cares. If not, they wouldn't be virtue, but you can have two switches, the switch of hatred or the, the, the switch of being generous. There's a very famous saying about that in ourselves we have two dogs. One dog is hatred and the other dog is love. Which dog you think it would grow more? And the answer is the one you feed more. Mm. So I, I believe in feeding things and doing things. And, I, and I, I wouldn't say, how do you feel in the COVID crisis? But I would tell, it's a shame that you're doing nothing for the COVID crisis. It's a shame. I tell that every day to myself. It's a shame that I don't build more gloves, that I don't, don't build more uh, things for the face. What are you doing? It's a shame that you're not feeding people. And then when doing things, all the things would come out. As long as you go to bed and you have done something else for other people, you will feel better. This is not about pandemia. This is about life. And this is the way I, I always have escaped from, from Sundays, for anxiety, for everything. Doing things for someone else. That's, that's for me, the key things in what they learned in the Andes. Of course, there are survivors that maybe they were not so strong. For example, Eduardo Strauch, he, he wrote a book that is called From the Silence. He used to look at the mountain and, and meditate, and, and that was great for him, and he survived. So there was the appropriate formula for him. But someone has to walk, and someone has to action. And for me, action is the key, the key way to for my, my soul to feel in peace. So what kind of action are you taking now for the COVID crisis? I understand you're now a cardiologist, a famous world surgeon that has helped to save babies and human lives. And what are you doing now uh, to, to help people in the COVID crisis? Well, I have my patients. I have pr pregnant patients that uh, they have uh, congenital heart disease in the womb of the mother and I must follow the patient and see what's doing. I also follow the patients that are sick and they have need control for the heart disease. I also have to quarrel with my family because they don't want me to go to the hospital because they say I am high, high risk uh, population. I am 67. And also we are building the respirators. I realized when everything began that we were going to get shortness of respirators. And as we are a small country, they wouldn't sell us. They would sell to bigger countries and we were run short. And I've seen in the mountain, some of my friends dying from shortness of breath. I said, this is not going to happen to me. So I said, here I am, like in the mountain. I'm not a mountaineer. I'm not a respiratory builder, but come on. What a respirator do? It inflates people. What's the pressure? What's the volume? How this work? And then all around the world, you have lots of people. They would tell you how, how to build this kind of, of respirator. So I say, let's begin walking. Let's see where we'll get. And of course, people criticize me. The intensive physicians say, um, you're crazy. But people give me credit. If Roberto is on it, it's going to work. So I only had to put the name. And then uh, I got around lots of people, lots more intelligent and capable than me. And they built the respirator. They didn't only build one, they built five. So today in the hospital, they are with a, a piglet just born, trying the ventilators, and we have three models. I think, um, yeah, okay. So this is very, very inspiring. And I know our students have questions for you. So Chael is an 11th grader. She has a question that she'd like to ask you. How are you, Chael? Hi. Hi, How I'm good. I'm very inspired. 
Um, of course, yeah, of course, of course. It was very inspiring. <laughs> so one of the questions that we had was, did you ever give up hope that you would not be rescued? Always, always I gave a hope and say I'm going to die and that's it. But in the meantime, I will keep going. It's, it's not about hope, it's about attitude. It doesn't matter how your soul feels. You push your body and get it going and we're, you're going to reach better time. It's, it's, it's about attitude, it's, it's enjoying, it's uh, finding the way. It's about you, it's in you, come on, it's not outside. We have Naomi also has a question for you. I think she has to unmute herself uh, and, and put her video on. Um, in your mind, do you still feel like the brave 19-year-old hero who saved his own life and the lives of his friends? Well, I have my attitude, but my bones tell me a different thing. Today, I went on a bicycle and my knee's hurting me and I need a, a knee replacement. But that's it. That's it. What I have. I uh, still uh, look to do things. I think that in doing things and uh, building, I, re I repair what I'm in ill temper. My wife said, let's look at something for him to repair and he will keep them used. Yeah. Uh, that's the way it works. But um, I would give everything I have to be your age and have all your uh, fraternities and have all the way to go and, and, and come on. <laughs> Tramel has a question for what? you, Dr. Wait, 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 Shamil. What, what's the name of your boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> I am a, a, a physician. I am prone to ask personal questions. I don't. I, I don't know if that, that's very proper. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think Chael is 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 choosing to not answer that question. <laughs> but go ahead if you want. To. Oh, no boyfriend. No boyfriend. Yeah, she's she's <laughs> she's single. I'm just teasing you. I'm just teasing you. You don't, don't need to answer the question. Go ahead. It's an honor to be teased. <laughs> Tramel, um, and Chael is one of our superstars. She's an incredible chef. She has a very bright future, just so you know. Um, Tramel, can you have a question for Dr. Canessa? Yes. How are you able to overcome the doubts in your mind and the fear that kept creeping up when you was on the Andes Mountain? Well, I don't have the answer. I'm still having my doubts. I still try not to, to struggle with the things, but... Um, you know something? It's um, I thought a lot about my mother, and I found out that when you have to do something for someone else, it's, it's better to do it for yourself. And we had gone to the graveyard because a friend of mine had died, and when we came out, the mother was broken into tears, and my mother said, "If one of my sons die, I will die of sadness." So. I was thinking of the idea of telling my mother, don't cry anymore, I'm alive. And this was what pushed me a lot in the mountain every day. It wasn't about me. It was about their, her suffering. And this is a stronger force to do something. This is something that Viktor Frankl, uh, a long time ago, uh, wrote about the, 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 the attitude of men. You know, speaking of Viktor Victor Frankl, he wrote this book. He was a, a survivor of Auschwitz in World War II, a Holocaust survivor. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he says, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice, sacrificing yourself for someone else. One of your survivors in the Andes, um, when you arrived back after you were saved, um, you all met the press and Pancho Delgado was asked the question about eating human bodies. And his response was, if Jesus at the Last Supper gave his body and blood of his apostles, he was showing us that we should do the same. It was a gift that each of them gave. You, when he said this, everyone cheered for him. And the Catholic Church 
immediately said that this was a correct action. When you change the meaning of an experience, it changes how you go through it. And that statement took something that was grotesque and elevated it to glory, to give your life for a friend. Right now, everyone is struggling with finding a meaning for the COVID crisis. What meaning should we have to make it through this? The meaning is that this is an ending. This is going to finish. This is the people are going to get the disease. It's going to go through, but in the meantime, we must have food for everyone. We must. Everyone has a must have a dish of food, and and, and the meaning is that I had ninety nine percent chances of dying, and in this crisis, you have ninety nine percent of surviving. So. I think it's it's more a psychological attitude where we are facing that a real problem. I mean, three million people died last year in the United States from the common flu virus, and uh, and there are some things we should do in order not not to get it contagious and not not to over uh, overcharge the medical system. Because if it's overcharged for coronavirus, then the other people would die from a heart attack and other infarction. But when they ask me if it's like the fuselage, I see, I say I understand. If you, if in a 60 square meter apartment with four kids, you feel that you want to jump out of the window. But if I tell you that our fuselage had 16 square meters and we were 16 people there and we survived 70 days I would say that people are living in a five star fuselage <laughs> and you are really very 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 gifted that, that this is your problem it's, it's more a, a mental attitude that what's going on and this is a new reality life now is different and as far as you have a place to sleep and something to eat the rest is on yourself. This is what we met, missed in the Andes. In the Andes, we, we missed having those vital primitive things. I think that that's the base of the pyramid of Marlowe. This is, has been studied among people that struggle. I feel I, I am like a, like a guinea pig that was submitted to an experiment. And all I can tell you is there was an experimentation animal, and this is what happened to, to us. And, and, it's a, and it's an experience that Suffering makes you a better person, and that's, that's very important. Chloe has a question for you. Yeah, so um, I was wondering if you had any advice for the people going through this worldwide pandemic right now, especially young people such as high schoolers or college students or even younger. Do you have any advice on how to keep your strength up? Well, first is that you should realize that you are going to lose things and that uh, things you don't like are going to happen. And that that's a reality for all the world. It's happening all around. So this is something that you must uh, deal with. But on the other side, there are some advantages about having time for doing other things that you must transform the problem in an opportunity, that's for sure. We're, we're living very spoiled, let me tell you, very, very spoiled. And now the plane has crashed and you realize what happens when a plane crashes because I was there and, and people are now around it. Tremel, do you have a question for Dr. Knessa? Um, yes, another question is, um, what does the word survive mean to you? A chance. It's a chance. Survival is a... Life is a chance. The only reality is death. We are going to die, all of us. The good thing is, in the meantime, what are you going to do with it? And not complain about that day. It's about the other days. I tell this a lot to my cardiac patients. Mm. 
Chael, Thanks. do you have a question? Yes, yeah, so I have another question. Um, do you ever feel guilt over any part of the Andes experience? I feel proud. I feel very proud that we did it in ourselves. I mean, what the desperation of our parents, the Air Force of Chile, Uruguay, and, uh, and Argentina couldn't do, we were able to tell all the world, you're wrong. We, ha we were alive. That's great. And that's about uh, being young. Young people are the ones that have to show the world the mistakes they are making. It's your time now, you know, guys. Because these students are about the same age you were when you went through this experience, uh, almost exactly. Um, Naomi, do you have a question for uh, Dr. Kanessa? Um, yes. What was going through your mind at night when you would sleep? I hope that tomorrow I'm alive again. And 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 the the strong sentences were were there's where there's life, there's hope, and perhaps tomorrow. That our our main ambitions on the mountain were very 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 simple and, and, and very low. But these are the places you reach when you're dying. Yeah. Chloe. So I personally was wondering about something. So when you had crashed in the Andes, you were um, a med student, right? Um, so I was wondering if Correct. your survival um, in the plane crash to the Andes made you reinforce your decision to become a doctor or did it make you a little skeptical? When I lost my life, my greatest ambition was to go back to the life I had lost and I didn't have treasured. So I wanted to go back to my life. I wanted to go back to, to what I was and in my plans was to become a doctor. Follow up, Chloe, ask another one. So, um, another question I had was, do you think the book um, Alive by Pierce Paul Reed um, accurately portrayed exactly how your experience went? Well, when there's an historical Thing that happens, people write about it, make films about it, and who knows the reality? The reality for me maybe is different than for another survivor. Okay, so I think we have a little transmission. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Canessa, you still I have, a, I, I have a yeah, I, I, I have a call from the hospital. Can you wait me for five minutes and I go back? Sure. So in the meantime, Dr. Knessa is going to rejoin our call. What I would like to do live right now is to get some reaction from you students. And um, we will begin with Tremel. Tremel, what is your reaction to what you're hearing right now? That his, I mean, I can agree with what he said, but I his definition of survive because you only get one life it just you just have to live your life how you want it want it to be you can't just be stuck and stuck at past and just be stuck and just not hate your life like it's yours you gotta live it everybody's gonna die like, that's mine feel free to feel free to jump in guys anyone who has a thought chayel how is this all landing on you right now yeah, I definitely agree with what Tramel said. Um, if I wasn't inspired before, I'm even more inspired now because like um, Dr. Canessa said, that life and being be able to survive, it's a chance. 
and not to focus on dying because everyone is going to die at one point, but focus on the little time that we have here and make the best of it. So that was really inspiring to me. It makes me want to help out more and do more things in the society and especially during this pandemic. Um, what he said was like very inspiring as Shail and Charmel said and um, as Shail said, um, it inspires me a lot, like do a lot more great things and like it motivates me more, encourages me more and Hearing from his opinion, from the questions, um, are very inspiring. So for people watching this live right now, uh, Dr. Kness has actually taken a phone call from the hospital. What we learned from him, if you're just tuning in right now, is that his view of how we should handle the COVID crisis is that we need to contribute. We need to give something to our fellow man to other people and that's the source of courage. It happens through action, by giving to others. And ironically enough, in this phone call, he had to take another call. He's going to rejoin us, but he is in the process of developing respirators because in Uruguay, there was a shortage of respirators. So he wanted to know that his friends, family, and countrymen have the medical needs met. And he didn't want to wait for someone else to meet those needs. He was doing it himself, and he's doing it literally right now on the call. Chloe, how is this landing on you? Um, all I can say is that with everything he said, I'm definitely no plane crash survivor, but I feel like I can relate to him in some way during this global pandemic when he says that he wakes up every morning and he only can think about what he can do more to help. Um. I feel like myself, I'm always trying to help people, regardless regardless if it's with my neighbors, my family, my friends. During this crisis, all you can really do is help each other, especially because, I mean, I'm not a doctor or anything, so I can't help professionally. So if someone needs me to go food shopping for them, like, I'm going to do it because that's the small thing that I can do to help. So Chloe, let me ask you this question, because you read this book and you really devoured it. I mean, you took it in. You know, there's book learning where we, we read something from a book or we learn it in a classroom, and then there's life learning. So we're at the intersection right now between book learning and life learning. So what is the impact of this moment re, uh, actually interacting with a man who you read about? Honestly, it's just completely like breathtaking. It's just if if any of you have ever read the book, it's just so emotional. Like while I was reading this book, I started to cry just because everything that's happening is just so emotional and it really pulls on like your heartstrings. And the fact that like this man that I've read about for, you know, two months is just talking to us on a video call is just so amazing. I, I don't even know how to process it. Is it different or similar to what you would have expected him to say? Um, he's definitely a lot cooler than I thought. <laughs> um, he seems pretty cool. I mean, right? anyway, go ahead. Go. He, he seems so nice. Like, I don't know what I was expecting him to be like, but that was definitely not it. He's like chilling in his backyard. I don't know. I just expected someone a lot more serious, but honestly, I like this so much better. And, you know, you raised the question earlier about him being a med student. I mean, you have to understand when he was on that plane, people were looking to him as though he was the doctor. He was in medical school for six months with no medicine, no equipment. And literally, he was treating people with gangrene in their legs. He was holding people's hands literally as they crossed and they died. And everyone was looking at him to fulfill this role and he was a year older than you. I mean, how does that impact you? Anyone, jump in, feel free. Honestly, it makes me feel like, like, what am I even doing with my life? Like this guy is saving lives at 19 and I like sit on my couch and eat Cheez-Its. Like, 
I just, it makes me want to do more, you know? Like this guy went through this horrible event and he still has the courage to go back and still help people. It just makes me want to do more with my life. And Naomi, I know that you, I know that, you know, kind of spirituality has like a strong meaning in your life. Um, when you hear him speak and it says that that's the lesson that he learned on the Andes. I mean, how does that message land on you? Um, well, I mean, as he said that, um, through that tough time, he made it, it made him, um, realize a lot, like, that he kind of needed God in that, in that, like, in that time moment, and, like, he realized, like, how bad of a situation he was, because he didn't know if he was going to survive and and inspiring us like like and he is back know, with us right now that was very well said so dr Knessa, the students and i were just having a conversation about our reaction and how um how much we're learning from your perspective on life on courage and we're kind of blown away right now um so i think tramel has a question for you right now um uh, but first, I have to ask this: this, this quest, the, the call you just received from the hospital, was this about the respirators? I think you're muted right now, Doctor Canessa. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. So there's a button on the bottom of your screen. If you press it, it will unmute. All right, we have to be patient, guys, right? Because not everyone's as familiar as you all with technology. All right, so... I'm not sure if um, Dr. Kenessa is frozen. I see that he is still muted, but he's still on the screen. Dr. Kenessa, if you can hear me, there's a button to unmute yourself because we can see you, but we can't hear you right now. By the way, I want to share, while he figures this out, I want to share with you guys, Dr. Knessa's wife is there two feet away. Um, they were childhood sweethearts when they were 14 years old. And when he was on the mountain for 72 days, everybody had given up hope except his then girlfriend, now his wife, and the mother of his children and grandchildren. Hi, Dr. Knessa. Yeah, my sweetheart. <laughs> oh, you heard that? Can you, you heard that? Now? We're inspired by her too. So um, we can't see your video. We see your picture. So in the meantime, we'll just go forward with it. I think Tramel has a question for you. Hey, how you doing, Dr. Vanessa? Um, now, 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 now you have my voice, correct? Yes. I hear you, yes. But your video, we can't see. It's a, it's a still image. We saw it a second ago. Yeah, when I, when I, yeah, when I came back, I was pressing yeah. the unmute button and it was not working. And now I see that my images come back and forward. I don't know what should I do. To, well, to I'll tell you what, we, fixed, can't, we can't be greedy right now. If we can hear know. you, we'll settle for that. If you can figure out how to show us video, that would be wonderful. And we will just keep rolling right now. Tramel has a question for you. All right. How are you doing, Dr. Knessa? My question was, how are you feeling at the moment of the crash, especially during the intensity of the plane being ripped in half in the sky? Once more, please, on the how, plane crash. What's how are you feeling again? at the moment of the crash, especially while when you 
while you was in midair during, while the plane was being ripped in half? Well, it, it was like a nightmare. I, I, I thought this cannot be true. This is impossible. It's happening. This is what the, the thought I had in that moment. Hmm. Okay. I mean... Dr. Knessa, I have a question. You've been talking about how in a crisis, um, people need to be thinking of others rather than themselves. Yes, there is yes. a, there is a problem. Ahead. There is a problem here where the, some people are, are hoarding and stockpiling um, resources such as toilet paper for themselves. What is your reaction to that? Well, you know that in the worst moments, it gets the best of people. But there are people that are not good. But I think that they should be convinced that we should work on telling them and telling the, the, all, the, all the environment that they shouldn't be that way. I mean, it's a, here in Uruguay, they let you go out, but you're not supposed to, to go. But we are all different, and freedom is is a very interesting component in people. So I I think that what I don't like is bullying the people that don't behave. I think that they should be let alone, uh, because this creates conflict, mm -hmm. and it's not the way to go. In in the mountains, when there was conflict, we just. Uh, keep it among ourselves. We spoke to the one, the ear of the other one, and of of course we all we all need a scapegoat to blame to, to bully. It's a human reaction, and I'm sorry that we were quite hard on some people that were st stealing toothpaste in mm. the mountain. But but it's not all virtue. It's it's an operating cost. The people that don't behave. That's that's why it's so difficult to be successful because. You must cope with this this problem. That the, this is reality. All, all the all the rest is theory. We lost transmission a second ago when the phone rang and it was the hospital. Were they calling to to mention about the respirators that you're building? Was that well, the point of the call? Yeah, yeah. They, they, you know what was they asked because I want to keep the the. The pig alive is a newborn pig, and normally in these experiments they they have to kill them to finish them. But I told if someone wants to bring the pig home, and they let me bring the keep the pig home to someone. It's like I'm not very good for following the rules. I'm always going a little <laughs> bit on the side. Uh, I will. Tell you, when I go to heaven, God is not going to tell me you're the best. Just He can put me someplace around, and I something inside me. I follow very a lot my intuition, and I want that pig alive. For me, that pig is a symbol, but for the faculty of medicine, that shouldn't be done. So she told me, uh, "Don't tell anyone. You can keep the pig." And I think it's <laughs> it's like a symbol. In those little symbols in these moments are the most important things to grab to. It's like Alito's Pai mm -hmm. saying, when I'm back, we'll make a barbecue. And then these are, are the, what makes us human, what makes us human, and I think that's great. So you, with a call, we save the life of a little newborn pig. That's a perfect symbol for all of us and a message for all of us. I think Chayel has a question for you. All right. So my question is, how did you feel seeing your friends pass away in front of you? Um, well, that's it. I said, it was this time it, it was you. Next time it will be me. I lost the the, the frightness of, of dying and when I came back and visited their mothers and they didn't want me to go because they want me to to stay and tell them about, about their sons and I came out and I say I had a chance they didn't have and I must treasure this chance 
in life. And this is the way I've been all my life, treasuring the chance that they didn't have. Do you have any fear of death now? Uh, no, no. I'm afraid of my sons. I'm afraid that my sons <laughs> could happen something and to my grandsons. But, but not for oh. me. Uh, oh. I, I'm done. I have achieved lots more than what I had imagined. But I still have a lot to give. I still have a lot to, to help. I have responsibility that when I get into something, people follow me. Uh, I, I grab a phone and, and call a doctor in the States to do heart surgery in the womb of the mother. And he will follow me. And now the kid, the kid is five years old. And I have another one in Houston that they said was impossible to get surgery. And they call me. So I have kind of, I am a player. I'm a player on the team and, uh, and I must play the game. And I feel very proud and happy about it. So it goes back to your rugby days on the rugby team. Well, in a way, in a way, now I'm, I think, more, more serious than at that time. I, I feel a, the, the weight of the responsibility. They, they used to give me the rugby ball and now they give me their kids. So it's a, it's a huge difference. So I, I know... Score, I must still score the try. <laughs> I know that, um, you know, we're running... Uh, a little bit low on time and I want to throw out to the students if there's any questions that you have that are burning that you'd like to ask Dr. Knessa while he's still with us uh, right now would be your time anyone who would like to go in um what was the most positive thing to come out of the incident the most positive thing is uh I don't know. I mean, that we did it by ourselves. That when, when I saw the helicopters coming down with my friends, they've been in the fuselage and they hacked me and, and we achieved it as a group. We, I, we had the pride of doing it on our own. And this is a pride that I always have. And, and you find out that there's no limits in what your dreams are if you begin walking is a travel of distance and 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 failure is an operating cost, or as they say in the states, they have lots more chances than us. Uh, failure is not an option. Any other questions to the to the panel, our esteemed student panel, Dr. Knessa? You once said about the survive. You once said about your friends that passed. They still whisper in our ears. Do you believe you'll see your friends again? That's a great question. Yeah, why not? Why not? Let's have dreams. Let's see them. You know something? When we were in, went to the mountains with my daughter, she was 15 years old. And she said, Daddy, I don't like this place because she's so sad, but has so much energy. And then I thought I heard myself saying, look at you, Roberto, you've grown a belly. How fat you are, you're ashamed. We are still young. We are still running in the valley. And I say, oh yeah, my friends, you haven't aged, but you know something in the meantime, look the daughter I have. And I wanted to share it with you, my friends. And we, th we take this gift. And the story of your friends, the ones who survived and the ones who didn't, have now, it's been introduced to a whole new generation who will take their story with them. And I imagine they will pass it on to their children. So the heroism that you showed on that mountain will live. It will live in these students. And we'll keep telling this story. Thank you so much, Dr. Knessa, for your heroism, your inspiration, and the gift of your time at this moment in history, this COVID pandemic. If you ever happen to be in Manhattan, would you consider stopping by Food and Finance High School and paying us a visit? Absolutely. <clears throat> you owe me a dinner. You owe me a dinner. I earn it. <clears throat> and our kids are the best chefs in the country. We will pay good on that debt. <laughs> we thank you so much. Uh, we wish you all the best. Um, is anyone else would like to say anything before we sign off, students?
Um, I wanted to add that um, speaking with him and the questions we asked um, are very, and the answers were like very inspiring and we can kind of connect it to a little bit to the coronavirus, what we're going through right now. Basically, um, we, we may not be like the doctors in the hospitals, like, you know, trying to deal with the corona, but us staying home, staying safe, at least helps out um, to prevent from having more people getting the coronavirus and pretty much kind of connects to not really because like I don't picture myself in a plane crash but his story is like very inspiring and like the the fact that he survived the plane crash is actually like very amazing so yeah Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Um, I, I have uh, I have a, co a couple of lessons I learned from the mountain. The first one is don't wait the helicopters to rescue. We had to go walking to tell where our friends were and to fetch the helicopters. The second one, all of us get from life more than what we need and we do less than what we can. We always can do more. Don't look at the mountain. Look at your next step. And you're able to give it, make another step and another step. Look at your next step. And my favorite one, every day I look myself to the mirror, I say, thanks God, the same fool as always. Vanity, vanity is a very, a very bad advisor. Very, very true. I watched a TED talk with Nando Parado, who you walked out of the Andes Mountains with, your fellow survivor and hero. And one of the lessons he said he learned was the value of the present moment. What we have right now, this is it. And this is what we can choose to either help others, be courageous, or not. Um, is that a message that you learned, the value of the present moment? Absolutely, especially for Nando that he lost his mother and his sister in the mountain. And when he went to his house at the fireplace, there were the pictures of all the, of the dead people of the family and, and his picture was there over the fireplace. So he had to, to grow lots more than, than I, I, I went home and all my family was there. On that note, we are inspired by all of you and we thank you so very much. And this idea of friendship um, is going to play out next week on Calm and Connected. We have a guest author. Her name is Kate Johnson. She wrote a book called Friendship as Freedom, Mindful Practices for Resisting Oppression and Building Community. That will be one week from today. As we sign off, just one final thank you and just deep, deep, deep respect for you, Dr. Knessa, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, and I forgot, I have a, a book called I Had to Survive that I think is a very good book. I Had to Survive. It was uh, wrote uh, by Pablo Bierce and me, and it's, 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 on, and it's on Amazon there. And it's about what happened afterwards, the plane crash. I think it's a, a very good contribution. Well, Brian, and yeah. Go ahead. I think I, might, I, I think I might assign that book to my students next semester when we're in person again. Well, it's called I had, I, I had, had to, to survive. survive, How a Plane Crash in the Andes Inspired My Calling to Save Lives by Dr. Roberto Canessa. When you finish your book, we'll speak about it again. That's a deal. That's a deal. Till, till that time, please stay healthy, Dr. Canessa. And to all of you at home, stay calm and connected. Good Have job, students. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.